There's a 50-50 chance we're living in a simulation. Maybe that <laughs> explains 2020. Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, uh, this article in Scientific American uh, by a writer named Anil Ananthaswamy uh, caught my eye, uh, not because it's tied to anything specifically topical. And frankly, it's a way out in the weeds discussion of this idea that perhaps we are living in a simulation. But I know you love this kind of stuff, and I wanted to bounce this off of you. Uh, basically, uh, when you read the whole thing, most people aren't agreeing. Most of the scientists don't agree that, you know, there's a 50-50 chance we're living in a simulation. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the challenges that we are part of some sort of vast computer simulation is the, uh, the supposition that base reality, whoever those people are in base reality out there, um, have unlimited computational power with which to execute this. And the thing that caught my eye pretty far down in the story was a scientist who was saying that they have been trying to simulate uh, a helium nucleus with like two protons and two electrons. I'm, I'm going from memory here. Uh, but right. and, and frankly, don't really have enough computational power to do that simulation. So supposing that some other civilization out there is faking all this that we're experiencing uh, is rather difficult. Do you have any preconceived notions about this idea that we're living in a simulation? I used to. <laughs> Before this year, <laughs> no. Before, before I, before I realized the arrogance of of, of the idea that um, me and my little uh, chimp brain, uh, living in three of eleven, uh, four of eleven dimensions with a limited view of the spectrum and all the rest of it, had a, had definitely got all the answers and nothing left really to solve. Um, when you say when, when the scientists who make this argument say that we, we must be living in a simulation because parts of this are unexplainable other than to invoke a civilization that is running the simulation that we're a part of and that we're not aware of, sounds to me that such a civilization has what you might even call godlike powers. Hmm. Um, one of the things that this this is there's a number of different outcomes. One of them is that they're true, and the other one is that it's not true. It pretty much gets to the heart of it. There's actually a trilemma that was proposed in a technological paper by somebody named Bostrom back in 2003. Uh, the three Never heard the term, but I love it. Yes. The, yes. The three uh, horns of the trilemma are first, uh, humans almost always go extinct before reaching the simulation savvy stage. In other words, the stage where they understand that they're in a simulation. Second, even if humans make it to that stage, they're unlikely to be interested in simulating their own ancestral past. And third, the probability that we're living in a simulation is close to one. So these are the three options. Another scientist has boiled it down to just two, more like what you said. I have a lot of respect for cosmologists. I, I, I genuinely do. Um, using these uh, little blobs jelly of ours, um, they have been able to unwind the Big Bang back to one hundred billionth of a second after the explosion at Planck time. So some some insane number like that. They're able to take everything they see and work it back to the Big Bang and get so close to the actual explosion that it is astonishing how brilliant this species is. But they can't get back to the actual explosion and they can't get back to before the explosion because there is no definition of what before the Big Bang is. We talked about this before where the term I like to use is we just don't have the horsepower to understand infinity and eternity. We don't have, we, we, we run up against the limitations of the number of neurons in our brain when we ask the question, what was before the Big Bang? Just, there was nothing just this week I read a story, by the way, that said there's a scientist who is being taken somewhat seriously who has said what was before the Bing, Big Bang was another Big Bang and another one before that, and there were a whole well, now, series of Big Bangs. Yeah, yeah, now, now hold on, because that's actually, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, uh It's big bangs uh, all the way down. Yes, but the, again, we're running into the to the uh, to the limits of what the human mind can understand emotionally. I'm not talking about mathematically. Mathematically, we're capable of wonders. But in terms of internalizing this information and dealing with it as human beings, what what the example that you were just talking about is called the oscillating universe. And the idea is that there's whatever there is or however it got there, it's been going on forever. Boom, bam, boom, bam, boom, bam. 
But the problem is, is that now we've gotten exceedingly delicate instrumentation and we have found out that the universe is not, is not slowing down, which is what would be required for it to slow down, stop, contract, and go through all this again. It's actually expanding. It's actually, it's actually accelerating out. And faster as it that, goes farther. Yes. And so as time goes on, the universe isn't slowing down its expansion, which is what you would need for an oscillating universe. It's, it's accelerating its expansion, which means that this is a one-off event and that we are living in the first hundred billionth uh, part of, of the total length of the universe and that almost all of the existence of the universe is going to be dark, cold, dead stars, for trillions and trillions and trillions of years, I saw a doc. I saw a great uh, video on this on YouTube where where the guy concludes by saying, "It's trillions of years where nothing happens and nothing continues to happen forever," um, and that's that's where the evidence says we're headed. It's inspiring. Well, well, but yes, but this <laughs> now we but now we get down to the point. Now we get down to the point. It it runs up against our. Our, our innate sense of, of, of rightness, that there's something wrong with that idea. And, and since scientists are not capable of going to what happened before the Big Bang, because the term doesn't exist, there is, it, it is a human construct. Nevertheless, what you end up with is you end up with a, a set of laws in the universe where some fundamental level, fundamental level, there is a lack of explanation for the how. And if you can't get the how, then you certainly can't get the why. And when people talk about using the idea that the entire universe is a simulation of a greater intelligence, you're kind of coming at the idea of God from the, from the, the back of the lab, right? The, the, this was, this was uh, the greater intelligence is the Wachowski brothers or sisters or whatever they are now. The, the scientists who are saying that this is a simulation and that, and that the parts of the simulation that are incomprehensible or unexplainable have to be due to the fact that it's a simulation and therefore the evidence of the simulation is that this doesn't make sense, so therefore it has to be an artificial construct. The programmer wants us to think that it might be a simulation. If, if the, we're, we're not talking about crackpots here, we're talking about extremely intelligent, highly advanced mathematicians who are running into fundamental problems with the structure of what they are seeing in the universe and as they try to wind the, the time clock forwards and backwards. And when they say things like, we are living in a simulation, it's because they cannot use any other method to explain discrepancies that they're seeing between theory and fact or to deal with issues that are beyond human comprehension in terms of what happened before the Big Bang, what's on the other side of the edge of the universe. It's expanding, great. And everything inside it is the universe with three dimensions and the Starship Enterprise can zip from one end to the other, yes. What's on the other side, not of the galaxy, but what's on the other side of the boundary of the universe? What's the bubble expanding into? Nothing. You know, nothing. I like, I like the micro what? view of this, Bill, because uh, that's the kind of the macro view and people always go to the big question. I like the micro view of the idea that if this is a simulation, then in essence, um, it's kind of like being in a movie, like what I'm experiencing right now, uh, they've only really painted this scene for me and there's nothing happening that the camera doesn't see, so to speak. So like when a movie happens, you have this sense, a phone call comes in and you're like, oh, that's right. Her boyfriend is in France and he's calling in. In right now. Nobody's in France. <laughs> it's, it's just that at that moment, we suddenly have the boyfriend back. Um, and it's kind of like the Truman Show. You know, people are where they need to be, except in the Truman Show, there was an entire set. For me, there's just this room right now, and there'll be a kitchen when we need one. We're touching on some really interesting things here because there is a, a, a strong amount of observational evidence, well, insurmountable observational evidence, that when we observe something, we change it that the act of observing something changes the outcome, that light will behave as a particle or a wave depending on whether somebody's looking at it or not. And if you accept that, and, and there's no question that that's true, but if you, if you extrapolate that out through the rest of the universe, you could make a version of the case that says that if there's nobody looking at the universe, 
then it doesn't exist. And it only exists when somebody is observing it, that when they observe it, they compress down the, the probability uh, waves of, of quantum mechanics and force the universe to make a decision. And those probability waves are set up to show us stars in the distance and all the rest. There's no larger battlefield on your computer monitor than the one you see on your computer monitor until you turn and move in that direction. Right. And so it's interesting when scientists use the term simulation because a simulation, a computer simulation, is something that we are now beginning to understand very well. And um, I wrote a, a, a screenplay back in the late 90s called The Microverse. And the idea was that they'd invented this quantum computer. And rather than program it, there was no way to program something that powerful. They simply basically gave it the initial equations of the universe. And the, the next thing you know, there's a big bang, there's a giant screen, and, 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 and life starts to evolve. And then they be, they're, they're moving so much faster than we are. It's a variation on another science fiction concept that you stumble upon some civilization whose time scale is so much faster that you tell them to do a job, you come back the next day and 20 generations have gone by and they've got the atomic bomb that you asked for. Um, but all of this stuff is, is interesting because we're at the point now with, with and we have been for, for decades and decades, we're at the point now where we can tell a computer that if we input this initial information and hit a button, it will spit back results that are within the confines of the of the program but but not but not predetermined random you put randomness into a program you're going to get random results back and you get an enormous amount of variety but you don't break any of the laws that are in the actual program if the laws of physics as we understand them are the are the laws of the that that have been put there in the simulation then the simulation meaning the universe will turn out uh, in infinite numbers of variations and interesting, interesting, it's fascinating little whirlpools of, of, of improbability, but it won't break any of the big laws. So we've been but living the in the Newtonian physics part of the, the simulation and we've unlocked the achievement level so we can move to quantum physics. That's that's pretty much it. And and this is called the anthropic principle, meaning the, the man-centered principle, the human-centered principle. And basically, in a nutshell, I'm oversimplifying, but in a nutshell, what this theory says is, is that if humans are the observers and they look into the night sky as cavemen and all they've got their eyes, then the universe is nothing but a series of specks in the sky. It's just it's just campfires in the distance. And as as humans develop more sophisticated instruments, and we're able to look deeper and observe deeper into the structure of the universe, the universe had to conform to that observation, uh, which was in a complete state of, of, of quantum unknowingness. It, it, it could have been anything. Then you look at it, it has to make a decision. And, and the, the anthropic principle basically says that the more sophisticated the, the, uh, the instrumentation we come up with, the deeper we can peer into the granularity of the universe, the more granular the universe has to become because of the act of observing it. But that's a little different than, than the, the simulation thing. So just to, just to close, the simulation thing is something that we can understand. We've done hundreds of simulations. Uh, we've got a simulation now that's running the world and that's the uh, climate change simulation. <laughs> and uh, and that, is, that is a computer program that many, 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 many people have more faith in than the actual atmosphere. And, and that, that gets to be a little bit dangerous. But seriously, all of this is just to explain the things that are unexplainable and, and to give some sense of, of purpose to this. This idea that the universe is just going to expand into heat death and proton decay 100 trillion, trillion, trillion years from now feels wrong. Now, that may just be the emotional reaction of a bunch of apes who don't like to face the fact that, that the future is not what they want it to be. That's entirely possible. But it's also entirely possible, I think, that we may be creating the universe as we observe it and and that we find that outcome reprehensible and so we are finding another theory to explain the uh the world that we live in in a way that is uh tolerable to to the human psyche we're grateful to the folks at Base Reality who have made it possible for us to do this by providing uh, some uh, <laughs> what they view as NPCs, uh, non-player characters, but we view as members crucial to the operation of this enterprise. These are the people you don't see who make everything happen. Um, Pay if up. We need better servers. If you'd like. That's right. If you'd like to uh, become one of the members at BillWhittle.com, just go to that website, click the big green button, and join us. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.